Well, this is Ann Zajac again, uh, here for my last mini lecture to lay the groundwork for using estimated breeding values in genetic selection for resistance to parasites. And I've already talked about some of the essentials of the important parasites of sheep and goats. I've talked about the uh, strategies we use for controlling the worms. And now I want to talk about genes and worms. So we can look at this sheep, this generic sheep, and say, how many worms are there in this sheep? Well, as we've talked about, uh, there are a lot of things that are going to determine how many worms there actually are in any given animal. There are factors that are related to the parasites. So how many infective parasite larvae are there on the pasture, that's certainly going to impact how many worms are in the animal. What species of parasite? Uh, some species like barber pole worm are incredibly prolific. Female worms produce thousands of eggs every single day. And so that can impact just how heavy the worm burden is in an animal. Of course, controlling the number of infective larvae on the pasture are the environmental conditions. Is it too hot? Is it too cold? Is there enough moisture? All that certainly infects the numbers of parasite larvae. And are the worms drug resistant? There's going to be a whole lot more worms out there to infect animals if we're dealing with a drug resistant population. But then we also have factors related to the animals themselves. Is this a well-nourished sheep? Remember, a well-nourished animal is going to be better able to control parasites for itself. An animal that has not got a balanced, healthy diet is not going to have a very good immune response to the parasites. How old is this animal? If it's a mature animal, then its immune response is going to be in place. It, are, it will be better able to limit the number of parasites than if it's a baby. Uh, which doesn't yet have a fully developed immune response. Are there any other health problems? Is this animal, uh, does it have caseous lymphadenitis? Does it have uh, pneumonia? Any other health problem can limit the immune response and the ability of the animal to control, to generate that immune response that can help control the parasite population. This looks like he's a ram. Is he under breeding or social stress or any other kind of stress? Stress certainly has an impact on the immune response. And is he too hot? Is he too cold? So environmental stress as well. But then all those other things apart, underlying that, there is another portion of what determines the number of worms in this animal, and that is the animal's intrinsic genetic susceptibility. So genes can affect susceptibility to infectious agents in several different ways. For example, uh, you can have cattle that have with one skin color, one hair coat color, they're less attractive to biting flies than cattle of another hair coat color. So that's determined by genes. That's one way genes can affect susceptibility to infectious agents. But when we're talking about the gastrointestinal nematodes, we're talking about the immune response primarily. So as I said, sheep and goats develop immunity. Uh, the immunity limits the success and the number of parasites. It doesn't eliminate the worms. The animals are still gonna have barber pole worm, but if they're fully immune, they're gonna have a lower number than they would if they weren't immune. Now this immune response is very complex and it's made up of several components. So it's not a case of just having an animal develop an antibody, a protective antibody. Antibodies are involved, but there are also different types of cells that are involved. There are also um, components uh, similar to an allergic reaction that are involved. It's a very complicated immune response because 
these are complicated organisms that the sheep and goats are trying to resist. It's not just a single celled bacteria, it's a big worm that is multicellular, has complex body systems. So it takes a complex immune response to try and limit those parasites. As I've said, not fully developed until about the time of sexual maturity so that young animals are more vulnerable. And even into that first uh, lambing or kidding animal, they're still gonna be a bit more vulnerable at that first parturition. The immune response is also more effective in sheep than in goats. Goats are more, a bit more vulnerable to these parasites. And as I've already said, the immune response can re be reduced in its strength by poor health or malnutrition or stress or lambing and kidding. So the complexity of the response, the immune response has always limited our ability to vaccinate for worms. And that's why you don't see vaccination as a component that is readily available and highly effective. We also don't have an easy genetic marker to identify those animals that have better immunity to the parasites. Now you might expect that all the animals in a grazing herd of small ruminants would have about the same number of worms. So you might expect that these animals if they're all the same age, all getting the same diet, everything's the same, you might expect the worms to be the same, the number of worms to be the same in all of them. But in fact, what we see is quite different. We actually see, even though these animals are all the same in every other respect, we see uh, differences in the number of worms that they carry. And that's because of the inherent variation in susceptibility to the parasites, or I shouldn't say that. It, that is in part um, due to this inherent variation in susceptibility because it's hard to make everything else equal. But we do have this genetic um, variation in susceptibility really determined by the immune response. And if we ask, well, how much of that animal's parasite load is determined by genetics, what you get is something like this, where if we make it into a big pie, you can see that the bulk of that pie, about 70, 80% of that pie is really related to things that are not, are not intrinsic to the animal itself. So all those environmental factors we were talking about, how many parasites are out there? Um, what are the conditions like for the animal? Is he stressed so that that reduces his immune response? Is he poorly nourished and that reduces the immune response? Is, uh, is he outside in the winter without adequate shelter? I mean, all of these things that affect susceptibility that are just temporary, that are determined by the environment, the age of the animal, all those fall into this huge portion of our pie that's not genetic. But we also have the inherent genetic variability that determines the degree of susceptibility to the parasites. And so the portion of that animal's susceptibility to worms is called heritable. And heritability is the proportion of an animal trait that's due to genetic factors as opposed to environmental factors. And the higher the heritability of any trait, the greater the power we have to select for it. Now the resistance to GI nematodes has about a 0.2 to 0.4 heritability. In other words, what we're saying is that 20 to 40% of the variation that we see in susceptibility to parasites is inherited. And that level of heritability is similar to the heritability of other common traits that we routinely select for. So that means we can intentionally increase the resistance to gastrointestinal nematodes in our animals by selecting for it. And by doing that, we reduce the reliance on dewormers and on other methods of parasite control. So how can you do this selection for increased resistance to parasites? 
Well, we know that some breeds have reduced susceptibility to gastrointestinal nematodes on average. And in the US, those breeds are uh, primarily, primarily recognized as being hair sheep. And of those hair sheep breeds, the Katahdin is the most popular. One of the reasons it's so popular now is because of that uh, increased resistance to uh, GI nematodes and barber pole worms specifically. Goats are not as well studied as sheep, but it appears that Kiko goats and maybe some others are a bit more resistant than some of the more parasite susceptible breeds. Actually, crossbreeding by using more resistant, combining more resistant and less resistant breeds will increase uh, to some extent the resistance in the offspring. So it is a strategy to use a more parasite resistant ram, for example, on less parasite resistant ewes. But to maintain any breed resistance, you need to continue selecting for it. If you don't continue selecting for it and concentrate on selecting other things, you could lose that breed resistance. And just as a very quick example of how that resistance can be really quite striking, this is an experiment that I was involved in now quite a few years ago, where we compared parasite resistant St. Croix sheep and parasite susceptible Dorset sheep, or more parasite resistant St. Croix, less parasite resistant Dorsets. These were lambs that were allowed to graze on pasture for 15 weeks. And then we took lambs of uh, five lambs of each of those breeds and actually counted the number of worms in their stomachs, the barber pole worms in their stomachs and other species in their intestines. And you can see a phenomenal num uh, difference in the number of worms total, the average total number of worms that we saw in these Dorsets versus the St. Croix. So the hair sheep showed better resistance than the Dorsets, uh, even as lambs, so quite striking difference. But the big message here is that you can select for resistance within a breed. You do not need to use a parasite resistant breed. And in Australia and New Zealand, they've done research with Merinos and Romney flocks looking at selecting specifically for resistance, increased resistance to parasites based on fecal egg counts and estimated breeding values. So what they did was took flocks of sheep and they did fecal egg counts on them, divided them into the 25% with the highest fecal egg counts, and meaning the most worms, the 25% with the lowest fecal egg counts, the fewest number of worms, and then everybody else in the middle made up a third group. And as you can see from one of these test flocks, over a period of about 20 years, all they did was they bred the high resistant group within that flock. They only bred high, bred high resistant sheep to other high resistant sheep. They bred low resistant sheep to other low resistant sheep and all the guys in the middle, they bred to each other. And what you can see in these three lines in the graph, these are the sheep with the lowest fecal egg counts. So the fewest worms, and you can see over that period of time that their egg counts just went down and down and down as indicated by the estimated breeding value. So a low estimated breeding value means low fecal egg counts went down and down and down. High resistance, low EBV. With those more, most susceptible sheep, they were bred to each other, their fecal egg counts went up and up and up. And then everybody in the middle just basically stayed in the middle. So you need to have a big enough group of animals to represent the whole range of susceptibility so you can make these breeding selections. Uh, and in this case, the progress was very rapid because they were using parasite susceptibility as their only breeding criterion, which is a research choice, but wouldn't be a real life choice. You're not gonna make breeding decisions based only on one trait, but you certainly can use uh, selection for resistance to parasites in any group of animals. You can use this strategy. And you should be using parasite susceptibility as a factor in making breeding decisions. The easiest one to, 
uh, decision to make is don't use your most susceptible animals as breeding stock. So if you have that one animal that has to be dewormed for anemia more than anybody else, for heaven's sakes, don't breed that animal. But you can also select the most resistant animals by using estimated breeding values from NSIP. And that's what we're gonna be talking about in the workshop. But even if you don't use estimated breeding values from NSIP, you still can do selection for increased parasite resistance and you should be doing that. Everybody should be doing that. You wanna ask about the parasite history when making animal per purchases. If people have a lot of problems with worms, maybe that's not a flock or a herd that you want to get new animals from. And when you're looking at replacements for your flocks and herds, evaluate your own animals so that you are uh, making decisions incorporating parasite resistance. It's not the only reason to choose an animal, but it should be one. And I'll uh, kind of finish off here by just showing you some real data from three Katahdin flocks where they used a fecal egg count estimated breeding value in their flocks, one in Maine, one in Georgia, and one in Ohio. These were Katahdin sheep, and they started this EBV for fecal egg count in about 2012. And you can see how the uh, fecal egg count uh, EBVs fell dramatically by using that as one criterion for selection, not the only one, but just, uh, just one of the factors used in selection. And we saw big uh, progress in these three flocks. So in summary for this portion, barber pole worm and other GI nematodes are not uniformly distributed in animals because of a number of factors, including inherent uh, genetic susceptibility. And that's related to the immune response, which is important in limiting GI nematodes in sheep and goats. That variation in parasite susceptible, uh, susceptibility is heritable, and we can select for more parasite resistant animals within a breed or using more resistant breeds. Now our live Zoom sessions will include information on how to evaluate uh, resistance uh, to parasites, and that will come in our live sessions. And so that's the end of my little mini sessions on uh, talking about the basics of parasites.